This is All in the Radio. Tonight we bring an interview with renowned American folk music singer and composer Pete Seeger when he was in Bangalore recently. Pete Seeger is interviewed by Stanley Joseph. Uh, when did you start music, Pete? I think I was before I was able to talk. My father and mother were playing musical games with me and trying to uh, teach me songs. And there were musical instruments all around the house. We had a piano and an organ. My mother was a violin teacher. She wanted uh, my brothers to learn the violin, but they rebelled. And when I came along, my father said, oh, let Peter enjoy himself, instead of making him practice all day. But she left musical instruments everywhere, whistles that I could blow on, accordions that I could squeeze, marimbas with little sticks. And at age eight, she gave me a ukulele. Do you know what the instrument is? It's like a small guitar. Yep. Well, I just latched on that ukulele and I uh, listened to songs I heard anywhere and pretty soon I was playing them by ear. And I didn't know the names of any of the music I was playing or the words, but I had the music in my ear. Only later on I realized it's a handy thing to know a little bit about music and when I got to be more like 20 years old I taught myself to read music and now I've even written books on how to read music. Oh. <laughs> What made you write the, uh, what made you particularly to write the song, If I Had a Hammer? Well, when I sing songs, sometimes I think, I wish there was a song on a certain subject. And if no one else has the song written already, I'll try and write it. It's not usually very good. I'm not a really good songwriter. I'm lucky that I've had two or three songs worth other people singing. And... Some of them came well known through other people singing them. My records never sold very much. I made a record of Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Yeah. I think the record sold one or two thousand copies, but uh, other people made records which sold hundreds of thousands or millions of copies. So the song is very well known now. Uh, the song If I Had a Hammer, all I did was put the tune to the words which were written by a friend of mine but my tune probably was, in fact, I'm sure, was not as good as it could have been because about eight years after I wrote this, the tune, Peter, Paul, and Mary changed my tune a little bit. They developed it in a slightly different way, and then the song just went around the world. Well, what made you write uh, this particular line in the second uh, verse of the song, saying, where have all the girls, go girls gone? Well, this is a good example of, uh, of how I think folk songs are often written. I was reading a, a Russian novel, Mikhail Sholokhov, telling about uh, the Cossack soldiers galloping off to join the army of the Tsar 100 years ago or more. And they were singing a song, and in the book it gave three lines. Where have all the flowers gone? Uh, girls have plucked them. Uh, where have all the girls gone? They've all taken husbands. Where have all the men gone? They're all in the army. That's all the book had, those three short lines. I said to myself, that sounds like an interesting song. I should look it up. But I was busy, and I never got around to looking it up. And one day, riding in an airplane on, on the way to sing for some college students, uh, I put it together with three words I'd thought of that year long time passing. And I said, that, those words would sing well, long time passing. All of a sudden I had a song, and then I took the, the intellectual's uh, perennial complaint, when will they ever learn, you know, ha wringing their hands. <laughs> and I had a three-verse song. I sang it that way and recorded it that way, but a young man heard my record and he sang it at a children's camp. By the end of the summer, he'd added two verses, where have all the soldiers gone and where have all the graveyards gone? And that kind of rounded the song out, brought it back to the beginning again. 
Uh, well, Peter, could you just sing these few lines of this particular song? Well, where all the I don't gone? really have any voice. Uh, I've done this for years. In, in Christian churches in America, they call this lining out the hymn. In the old days, people could not afford hymn books, and the preacher would uh, say, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, and the whole congregation would sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Well, who's blind? The whole congregation is singing because they've, he's given them the words, yes. and they can sing it. It's called lining out the hymn. I do it with many different kinds of songs. I do it with pop songs, even. Uh, did you ever hear the song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow? So I tell the story, and then I say, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and the whole crowd sing this song. Way over the rainbow, way up high, way up high. There's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. Very heard of. Land that I heard of once in a lullaby. So on. Do you still remember the Indian National Anthem? I was singing it the other day, but I realize I've forgotten some of the words. It is the longest yes. national anthem mm -hmm. in the world. Of course, I also think it's the most beautiful. Yes. That's all I can remember. I used to teach school and I had the children in my class singing the whole song. Oh, I do Jaya hai, yes. Jaya hai, Jaya hai, Jaya, 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 Jaya hai. Now that's the way it was taught me, ends on that unusual yeah. note. Yes. Most songs go down to the bottom again, yes. but it ended, Jaya hai. Very unusual. Yes. Well, Tagore was certainly one of the greatest artists of any century. Yeah. Well, Pete, what do you have to say about uh, the American folk music? Well, keep in mind there's many kinds of American folk music. The Native Americans, the, what we call the Indians, uh, had music for thousands of years. And then people from England and Germany and Holland came, and Ireland and Scotland, and they all brought music with them. And then they en enslaved Africans, and the Africans brought mu music with them. And so there's African-American folk music, and there's Irish-American folk music. What's happened in America, as you probably realize, is like the English language is a combination of German and French and Scandinavian, uh, American music is a combination of Europe and Africa, and now of Latin America and <laughs> Now that uh, you can now buy recordings from all around the world, the music of India is affecting the music of America. So uh, what I have to say about American folk music is that it's uh, not a simple, any one simple thing. I'm just one singer, but there are many other singers. Probably, in fact, I know are much more folk musicians than I am. I'm really kind of a, a, a 20th century special kind of pop singer, because I, I'm i not just singing in the kitchen right. or in the fields. I'm standing on a stage and trying to make my songs understandable to people who paid money for a ticket. Right. Well, what's your perception of truth? I always use my father's definition. He was a scholar. He said the truth is a rabbit in a bramble patch. And all you can do is circle around and point and say it's somewhere in there, but you can't really put your hand on its living, breathing body. All you can do is circle around and point. Well, you have something written on your banjo. Well, I had a friend, he was a great songwriter named Woody Guthrie. He wrote a song, This land is your land, this land is my land, from California. To the New York Island, 
This song is as well known in America as any song. No right. song ever. It's never been on the top 40, as they okay. say, but everybody knows it. Well, Woody went through World War II with a sign on his guitar. This machine kills fascists. Oh. He wanted his guitar to help win the war against Hitler and Tojo and Mussolini. Oh. Well, the war was over. He kept the sign on. We said, Woody, Hitler's dead. Why didn't you take the sign off? He said, well, this fascism comes along every time the rich people get the generals to help them stay in power. That's as good a definition of fascism as I know. Yes. I had a slightly different slogan. It says, this machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender. Correct. I hope. It's all you can do. Try. Right. What do you have to say about this? song, One Man's Hand. I had an anarchist friend, a cheerful fellow, Alex Comfort by name. I met him in London, England. He was a young scholar, and uh, he liked to write rhymes, most of them very funny. But this, he sent me these words, said, Pete, uh, could, would you like to make a tune for this? And I made a tune. And a number of people have picked it up, sung around. He became famous for a best-selling book uh, 20 or 30 years ago called The Joy of Sex. I'll give a concert every place I go. Right. I call it Singing for My Supper. Oh. I've done this all my life. I don't expect to get rich. I Right now I'm richer than I ever thought I would be. My wife married me knowing I was a crazy man. And... We lived really hand to mouth for 10 or 20 years. Good. And then I started earning money uh, that we could save. I think we took our first vacation after 20 years. And now royalties come in from my songs to pay our expenses, so I don't need to charge money when I sing. I sing for free everywhere I go. And all I need is the transportation to get there. Well, Pip. Nice meeting you. Uh, thank you. And all the best. That was an interview with the renowned American folk music singer and composer Pete Seeger when he was in Bangalore recently. Pete Seeger was interviewed by Stanley Joseph. This program came to you from the Bangalore station of All in the Radio.